Hey everyone, and today we will talk about mountains, as you can guess. Uh, so I have divided my presentation into two parts. In the first part, I will speak about the history of research of, uh, on mountains building in the world and in the Soviet Union. And in the second part, I will talk about my current project. What I'm working on is a Karatau complex formation project. And I would like to start with this citation from St. Augustine's Confessions, speaking about the beauty and impressions we get from observing mountains, seas, rivers, and oceans, and stars. Uh, we have mountains all around the world. Uh, in Russia, as an example, we have the Urals. In the southern Urals, you can see some photos from our expeditions and geological practices. In France, you have the Pyrenees here, and you have the Alps. I have never been to Alps, so such an image from the, from the internet. So mountains have been objects of interest for a long time for philosophers, for poets, for artists, and of course for scientists. The first theory explaining the formation of mountains dates back to the 18th century. Here you can see the author of the theory and then uh, they proposed that mountains were created from um, crystal crystallization from water. So earth was covered by water uh, entirely like by the world ocean, and mountains have formed from, from this water. The next theory was, uh, this, this theory, sorry, the first theory is called Neptunism. Uh, the next theory is called Plutonism. It's uh, the followers, they proposed that mountains uh, were formed by vertical uplift from down to up by the internal forces of the earth or internal heat of the earth. Uh, the next was contraction hypothesis. Then they proposed that mountains formation was caused by contraction of the earth by when it has cooled down. So they thought that earth in the beginning, it has a big temperature, it was molten, and then little by little it has contracted and uh, mountains have formed. Like if you bake an apple in an oven, for example, you will see the structures on it. And that's why this theory is also called baked apple theory by its uh, by the by analogy. Uh, the next was the geosyncline theory of Hall and Dana. Uh, it's in mid 19th, 19th century. It's a little bit more complex, but uh, here is the explanation. They suggested that on the Earth there are special territories. They call these territories geosynclines. It's a linear trough of subsidence within which uh, vast, vast amounts of sediments accumulate and which was uplifted after, afterwards. So it goes like uh, subsidence, then accumulation of some sediments in the, in the basin, and then vertical uplift also from down to up. And what is in common for all these theories is that all these theories are wrong mountains formation concepts. Uh, the next important point is the discovery of completely, completely new phenomena. It's horizontally displaced layer, layers located over uh, other others, uh, like you can see here. This was discovered in the Alps by Bertrand, Lejeune, and Heim, and later this notion of uh, thrush, they call this thrush sheet, and this notion was later developed by Ekron, and this was completely new for that time. This discovery it provoked a major discussions among geologists. It wasn't accepted uh, just uh, easily. And only in 1903, in the ninth, ninth Geological con Congress in Vienna, this new phenomena, trash sheets, were officially recognized. But their existence was considered possible only in young mountains like, like Alps. If you look at this map, it's uh, all with, which is uh, shown by yellow color and uh, nowhere more. So this uh, big limitation for this uh, discovery. Uh, the next uh, also important point is the theory of continental drift of Alfred Wegener. 
So he proposed that Earth continents have moved for the geological time relative to each other. He wasn't the first to make this uh, supposition uh, just in the beginning, just by comparing the shores of different continents. But he was the first to find some evidences like distribution of some extinct animals or plants. If we connect all the continents, the distrib distribution matches up and also distribution of some ancient rocks uh, connected with uh, ancient ice sheet. Also, if we connect all the continents with this distribution, it matches up. But his discovery, neither his discovery was accepted. Uh, and one of the reasons was that by education, he was a meteorologist. He wasn't even a geologist at the time. And uh, geologists at the time that told him that mountains are not clouds to move around the earth like this. Like uh, some example of geological racism. Uh, if, we, if Demetrius, for example, he will, he will start to study geology and sometimes he will make a geological discovery. He may be told that mountains are not investors to do like this or something like, like that. So uh, another point is that in his, in his story, he couldn't, the weak point was that he couldn't explain the force which moves the continents. <laughs> But also, uh, so the th his theory was rejected completely. But also at that time, geologists, they had to explain these distributions, distributions of animals. So they had some crazy explanation that like some time in past, there were some land bridges between continents where the animals would go back and forth. Uh, so um, at that time, the two schools in geology were established. Like some supporters of Wegener and some supporters of crash sheets, uh, so horizontal displacement of layers, they were called mobilists because of mobile uh, continents. And other geologists, they, were, they believed in fixed continents and they believed only in vertical movement, so vertical creation of mountains, and they were called fixists. Uh, struggle between fixists and mobilists uh, became a red threat in the history of geology in, to, in the 20th century. Uh, the next important discovery is the discovery of mid-ocean mid ridge in uh, 1953, which rise uh, by two kilometers above the ocean bottom. And by the early 1960s, a topography map of the bottom of the world ocean was compiled. Uh, an example you can see here. And prior to this, geologists, they thought of uh, the bottom of the ocean as an ordinary, ordinary depression. So they thought that it's very simple, it's, uh, its structure. But it was not simple, it was quite complicated. And at that time, uh, sea floor spreading theory was proposed by Dietz and Hess. So it's a process that occurs at these mid-ocean ridges where new oceanic crust is uh, being born uh, by this volcanic activity and these new rocks, this new crust is being pushed from the ridge to the left and to the right, as you can see in this animation, for example. Uh, this was also proved later by the discovery of linear magnetic anomalies. Uh, not to be uh, too complex, I would say just that here is the map what they get uh, by this linear magnetic anomalies. Uh, by the color is uh, negative uh, or positive magnetic anomaly. And this is due to the to two phenomena phenomenon, uh, that we have inversion of magnetic pole of the Earth, uh, and then we have these new rocks forming in, at mid-ocean ridge. So rocks which, are, which record present to the magnetic field present to their formation. And all this new data together with the theory of Wegener of continental drift that uh, led to the creation of theory of plate tectonics, which is accepted nowadays among geologists. It was created by, by Mackenzie, Morgan and Le Pichon and was later developed by uh, Dewey. And it states that we have uh, outer crust, solid outer crust, we, we call the lithosphere, which is separated into plates that move over the asthenosphere. It's a molten upper portion of the mantle. So the plates, they come together, they interact, and all major geological processes, processes like mountain building, volcanism, and earthquakes, they occur due, due to the plate movements. Here you can see the major plates of the earth, 
and here is the lithosphere. Uh, it's approximately, uh, in average, it has thickness of 100 kilometers, and below we have this astenosphere. So how to, for you to have an image, it's like if we have an, if we take an egg and an eggshell, the, the, the lithosphere is an eggshell and the neck is, uh, is the earth. And also in this, within this theory, they have finally explained the force which moves the plates. It was a convection in the mantle. And with, with, with this theory, it became simple, the distribution of the volcanoes, as you can see here, they all are situated on the borders, almost all are situated on the borders between plates. And the same thing is with earthquakes. Uh, later, it was also approved by uh, the age of oceanic crust. Here in red, you have zero, and it goes up to 180 million of years, millions of years. So here, where we have the mid-ocean ridge, it's the uh, youngest rocks. And when we go further and further from the mid-ocean ridge, it goes uh, older and older in the age. And uh, nowadays, it's just um, direct measurements. So data, data, GPS data has proved that continents are moving. Uh, for example, France, along with the uh, all Eurasian plate, is moving to towards the Pacific Ocean at a speed of approximately 1.5 centimeters per year. So like where where it's the same speed, approximately uh, like the growth of the toenails. But this was how it go, go, how it went in the world. And in the Soviet Union, it was completely different. Uh, the first mobilist in the Soviet Union uh, was Fredericks. He has found the same structures, the trust sheets in the Southern Urals. And his new idea, he, uh, it found some support also, but most Soviet geologists, they rejected the trust sheets. And uh, at that time in Soviet Union, there was struggle against Buja ideas in science. So mobilism, it was banned uh, completely by, because of its Western origin. For example, it's much more common, much more famous in the world, the history or the story of persecution of genetics in the 30s in the Soviet Union, where when we had this outstanding uh, biologist, Vavilov, and we had this uh, villain from the science, Olesenko, and at that time, there were more than 3,000 mainstream biologists who were imprisoned, dismissed, or even executed in this campaign to suppress scientific opponents. For example, Vavilov, he was imprisoned and he died in prison. And here you can see some photo of this uh, Lysenko giving some speech, a mix of pseudoscience with propaganda. And here is a Communist Party and Stalin himself. So it was the same story was with the mobilists, with the Soviet mobilists in uh, in the Soviet Union at that time. Uh, this outstanding geologist Fredericks, he was accused. Here you can see the craziness also of his accusations, like to prepare the murders of uh, Comrade Stalin personally. And the same was uh, with his co-author on the fascist Zenchenko, who was executed. Uh, for example, George Spatula was sent was sent to the Gulag. Because only because of her scientific views. Uh, Professor Mushketov was executed, the same because of his uh, support for the fascists. And academician Arhangliski was uh, died in uh, sanatorium Uskaya, and some people say that his death was violent at that time. And this is uh, just uh, examples of some famous geologists. They were, they were, of course, there were much more. And uh, our, uh, academician Arhangliski was the last famous geologist supporter of the fascists at that time. So as the result of this intervention of the government and the science, and uh, many years of efforts, a strictly fixist model of the geological structure of the Soviet Union was created. And it looked so convincing and was defended with such presumptions that Foreign scientists, they started to doubt, they started to wonder if the territory of the Soviet Union is different from the world. For example, if I would give this speech uh, 70 years earlier, I would say that our the territory of Soviet Union, the mountains have created from vertical movements. Uh, I would try to be very persuasive. And I hope the, the geosciences lab, they will 
believe me, at some point. So, uh, uh, not speaking about the tragedy for all these lives of uh, geologists, of mobilists, this was a big a drawback for geology at that time. So we just stopped developing and we get back in tens of years. And only in 1954, like uh, almost 20 years after Frederick's, uh, Kamaladinov has have made his first major discovery. He uh, mapped the Karatau Ridge as a thrust sheet, as the same structure, uh, horizontal displaced structure. And at that time, all tectonic reconstructions in the Urals were made exclusively from the thesis model. So they supposed that blocks were created from ver uh, vertical movement, and it's like the piano keys. Uh, here you can see this cross section, geological cross section. Here you can see the depth. Uh, here you can see some rocks and here you can see faults. They all them are vertical because of the supposition of vertical movement. And here you can see the, it's, of course, it's much more modern uh, cross section of this territory, but here it's like it looks like in reality, which was created by horizontal displacement of layers of such faults and such faults with a low uh, angle. Uh, the next uh, was discovery of uh, transported nature of Kraka ultramafic massives. Uh, here is where is it situated. Uh, and these ultramafic rocks, these are rocks which are buried deep down in the mantle in general. And this in the southern Urals, they were at the surface. So prior to Kamaladinov, the geologists thought that these rocks were formed by, were formed by intrusion like you can see here in this animation. So it went from deep down to the surface and he, it get there. But he has proved that these rocks were formed by horizontal displacement and transportation. So that's why they, they, they were leave, left on the surface. Like, like you can see here in this animation, like showing in the green, green uh, color. And why it's, this is important, uh, I, can, I would like to, to show it on this example. We have in the middle Euros, we have a Stanisk ultramatic massive, the same rocks. And with these rocks, ultramatic rocks, the chromium ore is associated. So we uh, get chromium from it. And this massive, a Stanisk uh, ultramatic massive, was drilled by a set of more than 100 wells. Here, all these black points, these are wells. And when workers were asked why you have drilled so many wells, they told that we were looking for this channel. So they thought that there, it's an intrusion. They were looking for this channel for, to get more ore in it. But the concept was wrong. It was completely wrong. So the, it was all the waste of money only because of this concept. Another practical use is that uh, Kamaladinov and their group, they have discovered a number of oil and gas uh, deposits. Here is an example, a typical example of oil and gas deposit. Uh, oil and gas, it gets in uh, such structures which are called anticline structure because oil and gas, they are lighter than water. So they are pushed by water to, to fill this structure. So in geology or in geophysics, they try to find such structure, then they drill a well and then they get oil and gas. So uh, these structures, if we know now, 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 they can form also because of horizontal displacement of layers, as you can see here. And this is this anticline structure complicated with a fault, and you can see here in, in red. And Kamaladinov and his colleagues they proposed that if we found one deposit, which is shown in black here, with, which is complicated by this fault, and then we follow this fault to the north or to the south on this map, for example, we will find the deposits which will follow like uh, analogies, like uh, pearls, which are strung on, the, on this bead. So at that time, finally, the, the, uh, the mobile structure of the Urals was accepted, but it was uh, years later of the component to the world, it was like, almost 20 years later in 1950, 1983. And uh, Kamaladinov with his group, he has created the first NAP theory. Uh, so uh, at the end, 
of the his history, the finally mobilism has won in the world and in the Soviet Union. So uh, geologists they have seen that it's horizontal displacement of layers which creates mountains. And uh, now I'm going to speak about my the second. It's the second part of my presentation, and now I, I'm going to speak about my project which I'm working on. And I hope that now you can see the also the historical importance of this project because it was uh, the first structure was within this complex which was uh, mapped and shown like a thrust structure. So here is the location of the territory which I'm working on. It's a south and, within the southern Urals. It's just right here. Uh, it stands out with its topography also. And uh, geologically speaking, uh, geologically speaking, at the surface of this territory, of this structure I'm working on, we have rocks with the age from 1 billion to 300 million years old. Uh, this structure is one of the most geologically diff difficult structures in the southern Urals. And there are different views on its geology and formation up to date. And also the question is why it has formed uh, exactly at this place. Because you have the Ural Mountains, like the, the front of mountains here, and then the front uh, it was advanced within this structure. And that is one of the reasons why in our project we apply modern methods of experimental and numerical modeling in order to understand these this, uh, questions. Uh, and that's why we do it in collaboration with Geosciences and Environment uh, Department and Lab where they have uh, experts both in experimental and numerical modeling and in structural geology and uh, tectonics. So uh, as Flora has said, we have some history in this uh, collaboration with the Geosciences and Environment Department. It has started in 2015 from this visit of uh, Bertrand Mayo in Bashkir State University. Then we had some exchange for geological practices for in, in the Pyrenees, uh, you can see here in, in the Urals. Of course, it has stopped due to the COVID. Last year was 2019. And we have uh, also made some geological excursions together in the southern Urals. So uh, now it's the Karat is the Karatau project. Uh, experiments are impossible in geology. Um, it's not a chemistry when you can make some reaction and you can, you can get some chemical element because objects are too big and the time and the processes are too long. And by the size, I'm talking about tens or hundreds of kilometers. And by the, length, by the time, I'm talking about tens or hundreds of million, millions of years. So that's why modeling is, is important, it's crucial. Of course, it's not like this we do it, it's like a little bit more complex. Uh, the modeling, experimental modeling, had, has also its own history. Here you can see a photo of, from the uh, end of 19th century of some uh, famous experiment. Here you can see that uh, the wall which is pushed horizontally it creates some topography here. It's uh, layers of, of clay. Uh, experimental modeling is related to mechanical theoretical analysis and to numerical simulations. And nowadays, uh, it can be so sophisticated that it is even hard to, to tell with the results of modeling, where is the model and where is the reality, as you can see here in the example. Uh, in the lab, we have, they have an equipment to do the mod modeling, with, uh, to sift the sand, to, to do this uh, experiment. Here you can see an, an example how it how it goes one of the examples. And also they have programs in order to do uh, numerical modeling or to um, post-process the results of experimental modeling. Uh, we work also in collaboration with Vashnefti Geophysica who provides us with important data. And this data is uh, Professor Siegfried Lallmann and Professor Dominique Faison de la Motte who are actively involved in this project in order to make a interpretation of this, of this data. So we, uh, 
put in forefront our hypothesis based on Kamaleddinov's and Brown's ideas, also not to, uh, to simplify our hypothesis, we had, we had uh, to form a Karatau, we had a uh, extension, firstly, it's like north-south extension, like you can see here in this animation. And it forms such a structure, which is called uh, Graben in geology. Then we had east-west extension also in this direction to form an ocean. And then at last we had east-west compression like this. And these structures, which were formed previously, they were reactivated and they then they have created a Karatau complex. So we use experimental modeling in order to check our hypothesis. And the work, work is goes uh, like this. You have initial data, you uh, make our, we make our hypothesis, we pass to the model, we make a numerical model in preliminary check, uh, then we go to the construction of our experimental model. When we do experimental modeling, and after that, we uh, do post-experimental stage. Like we cut our model, we see the structures inside. Then we can do numerical modeling. And at last, we can compare results of experimental modeling with numerical one and with initial data. And with, if we are not happy with any of the results, we can go again to any stage and do it again and again. Uh, here you can see an example of how a model is prepared and created, like sifting the sand in it, uh, like some calculations and then cutting some stuff we need to, to build the model. And here you can see uh, some of the results of the experiments, uh, top view of this uh, sandbox, which is being pushed. And we have some structures which are being formed. And we are interested in this structure in the middle. And this is an example of uh, one of our modeling altogether from the, from the setup. And then we have this compression do you see these folds and folds uh, which have been formed and you see this structure which we, what we try to to recreate uh, something which will be similar to this Karatau complex and then we moisture, moisture the sand and we cut it and we see the internal structure so these are the results of one of our modeling here is a geological map of real territory here is a top view of our model and the cross section from A to B. And uh, that's, that's it. And I would like, at the end, I would like to thank CY Advanced Studies for financing my six month stay here. Of course, I am not hoping to, to make great discovery, but I hope to make at least a good article on this, uh, with these results. Uh, also thank I would like to thank my hosting department and hosting lab, the Geosciences and Environment Lab. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much.